Well, good afternoon to you all. My name's Paola Totoro. I'm a former Europe correspondent for the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, and I'm now president of the Foreign Press Association in London, where I live and work. It's truly a joy to be here within conversation with an artist whose work I've loved and admired for decades. Michael Looney really doesn't need much introduction. There'd be very few Australians who haven't turned around to a colleague or family member at some point and said, check out Looney's latest. Indeed, there'd also be even fewer Aussies who haven't been profoundly moved by Lunig work at some time, or prickled, or sparked into a debate, or even angered or offended by him. I've only just told Michael this story, but I was Saturday editor of the Sydney Morning Herald when the then editor-in-chief, Alan Oakley, was so outraged by a cartoon of a small, bespectacled man titled No Disrespect Intended that he refused to publish it. Now, I adored working with Alan, and, but on that occasion we had a really stinking fight, and I lost. And Michael's excoriating cartoon was published in The Age in Melbourne, but not in the Sydney Morning Herald. Went viral, of course, Media Watch had a go, and now it's still there. If you Google it, you'll find it under the keywords Lunig, John Howard and Brown Nosing. <laughs> <sighs> And yet Michael's not, of course, just a newspaper artist and a cartoonist. The work he's done for more than 40 years. He's also a writer, he's a painter, he's a poet, and he's a philosopher. He's exhibited nationally and internationally. He's collaborated with musicians, including the Australian Chamber Orchestra. He's performed poetry at the Sydney Opera House, and he's appeared at the National Theatre in London. Stage production based on his work toured England, Ireland, Europe and Australia. And he's written songs with Neil Finn and Richard Tognetti. And of course, he's been a living treasure, national living treasure since 1999. And I nearly forgot that to date, he's published 27 books. Now, Michael's not only been a commentator on Australia's national and political life, he's also an acute observer of our emotional and our internal lives as well. So today, I'd like to talk to Michael about this more personal world, the one that he explores in his splendid new book, Holy Fool. It's a big, beautiful thing. It's a doorstopper. I'm sure you've all seen it. And it contains a collection of more than 240 artworks, all of them imbued with colour, with thought and delightful ideas. Michael describes his own work as regressive, humorous, messy, sometimes mystical and even vaudevillian. This book's a little bit of all these things, with all of it dancing around that delightful archetypal character, the one we all know so well. The one with the big nose, the innocent and lively eyes, the one who can be accompanied by a duck or a fish or a teapot, and the one who, in my mind, not having met Lunig until today, or yesterday actually, I've always thought as Michael Lunig. <laughs> so I think we should start here, if mm. that's okay. Can you tell us a little bit about that enchanting archetypal little character? When did he first come out of your pen? Um, uh, Paola, I can't remember when he started or she started or it started, whatever it is, because <laughs> it's all of those things. It's a sort of a human spirit and probably a bit of an animal spirit as well. It's very creaturely. And um, I don't know, it emerged maybe during my childhood or teenage years, just gradually, I, I can sort of link it back, a continuous line to that little playful drawing you do when you're young on the back of an exercise book at school, when it invents a little expression of self, perhaps. And, um, and that's probably what it was, or, or just the human spirit, I guess, if I reflect on it. I mean, I didn't think that in my head when I'm drawing it. I was just drawing a cheeky little thing. And so only now, at this stage of life, you start to psychoanalyse it all. <laughs> <laughs> but he hasn't really... He's, he's been a kind of constant, hasn't he? And maybe the world's changed, but this little creature has stayed with you in the same form. Mm. Is he a...? Uh, yeah, I guess there's a lot of yearning in that creature. It's a, it's a, it, as I say, it's a spiritual thing, even though it be humorous. And, you know, humour is very spiritual business. And um, uh, I think there's a lot of wisdom in humour, unintended wisdom. But it, it, um, it, yeah, it just has been a little yearning expression of how you want life to be or other people might be or what we, I could be or what I yearn to feel or, you know, the disappointment of life and being rough handled by 
people around you as a childhood and uh, in childhood and right through to the day you die, uh, you yearn that it, the world be caught so, uh, kind of softer, kinder, wiser. And if you can't find it as much as you'd like, you, you kind of try and create it as a as a kind of a little nourishing, consoling thing. You, you, you make what you can't have. Is know. it a little bit of an antidote to fashion? You know, a, a little bit of a, mm. a steadying force in things changing so quickly in the, in the world outside? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good observation, a little counterpoint to the, for what is fashionable and passing and deadly earnest as it passes. And this thing has a kind of an angelic quality, not the pious angel, but that little playful angel, which is the angel in the child, and which I've recently uh, sort of find myself using this term um, a, a sort of a mature innocence, an innocent creature, an innocent spirit, but also old somehow, ancient, yeah. and it's... And I wise. do think we, ha yes, maybe wise. We, uh, and I do feel we all have this capacity for innocence, which we often repress and deny, and we feel vulnerable about. But I think it lies at the heart of creative, any creative activity, that innocence. And people would say, "Well, you can't be innocent. You're an adult." And I say, "No, you must. You can have a mature innocence, and that is that capacity for openness, to not know, to, to open the heart and." Uh, so, so that's innocent and wondrous too. And ask this question: What is this? Yeah, like in this room now, wonder. what is this? All you people there, us here, what is going on here? <laughs> and what would a child feel sitting here? There's a little bit of that in me at this moment as I look out. <laughs> Quite a large bit, actually. <laughs> Well, that's a, an opening for me to take you back a little bit to childhood. You were born in East Melbourne in 1945. Yeah. You're the second eldest of five. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit about that childhood? But also, there's a, there was a life-changing experience as a little boy, as, a, as an eight-year-old, I think. What happened? Um, as a child, yes, well, we called ourselves working class people back then. That term doesn't exist as much these days. It had real meaning to me then. I lived amongst the factories in the western suburbs of Melbourne on the suburban fringe. Um, my father was a meat worker. And uh, we played, I played, my favourite place to play was in the swamp by the river or in the rubbish tip, which was a <laughs> massive, wonderful, rich rubbish tip. A lot of government factories, the Defence Department had all sorts of astonishing Stick things that threw away. <laughs> so we would go there on the weekends, with, I would go there with my dog, my Shanghai, and uh, a box of matches. And we, would <laughs> 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 we would create massive fires and great pools of black smoke would be seen floating over the western suburbs of Melbourne on a Sunday or a Saturday afternoon. But one day, uh, at a very young age, I uh, was wandering in a tip with my cousin Robert and I stood in a uh, what I thought was solid ground, but it, it, it was a pit where people had burned us uh, well, they, they lit a fire, and um, it, it was tyres, and I plunged into it up to my above my knees, and it was full of wire, which I got tangled in. I couldn't get out. My cousin dragged me out. Anyway, the upshot was I, um, I, I remember ripping the entire skin off my mm. leg like a stocking, and it was a horrific, horrific scene, and meant that I couldn't walk for about six months. But uh, terrible burns, complex burns injuries where I nearly uh, lost my toes and a wonderful doctor attended me. He was the first person to encounter my cousin, took me to this doctor's surgery that was open and I was carried in and they gave me the chloroform to knock okay. me out. And, and um, this doctor tended this wound and he learned and knowledge says he should have, uh, I should have had two couple of toes amputated, but he took a huge risk, he later revealed, to save the little boy's toes, which he did, at the risk of losing the whole foot, by the way. And, to, and, and, and then he even came and taught me to walk again. And then he didn't charge my parents a single penny because of how involved he became in the risk he took. So yes, I spent a lot of time lying in bed, listening to other children play out in the sunshine somewhere, a lot of time to reflect, to so think. So do, do you think that isolation and seeing the world from outside and hearing life from afar kind of shaped your creativity or it had an effect? 
I, I, I believe that all childhood experiences, including the pre-language experiences, have a huge impact on us and we can't really know the depth of that and the complexity of that. But I feel something resonates when you say, you know, lying there if, as a boy, isolated. I don't know whether I feel like an outsider genetically or something or or whether it's a healthy thing to be an outsider. You know, as Goethe said, join the smallest crowd. <laughs> and um, I, I love, I'm not keen on big crowds. And, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but maybe it did. It, it was a wistful, sad, yearning time lying there. And then the painful changing of these dressings and stuff. Yeah, it was a horror time. Because you would have been hearing the kids play, wouldn't you? So it was a kind of distant. You did. But then you, there was also the lovely side where people would be brought in to visit me. You mm. know, this idea of you're, you're there, crippled sort of. Yeah, so they're tending. And they came. And so you got a lot of love and the doctor, people doing their best. So it was a funny balance hanging there between loneliness and isolation and great attention to yeah. Afterwards, back to school, you, you tell us a little bit about school because you weren't a lover of school at all. And um, in, this, in your new book, um, you talk with uh, quite some melancholy about that lovely part of childhood where we sing and we paint and we draw with that inhibition, but that school comes yes. in and hammers it out of you. Well, that's a retrospective understanding. And I, I, it's actually not true that I disliked school parlour. I had lovely friends. I had the, the good fortune of, of just enough good teachers. And it's just that I wasn't good at it in terms of passing exams, you see. And I do have very fond memories of, of friends, teachers, experiences. Yes, but it was a harsh time. The 1950s in Australia was corporal punishment and regimentation, militarised sort of uh, marching in and all this kind of thing. And um, yes, it was repressive and disciplinarian. That was a state school. And, um, uh, but, you know, a boy he fights it in his mind and has fun with it too. And do you know what I mean? You, you yeah, resist yeah, yeah. and keep your spirits up. So do you think that that sort of experience of that kind of uh, is what has helped you maintain that kind of playfulness? Because you have maintained it all through your life. Did you have to battle it early? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I, I think that playful time is so important. And also, I didn't submit. I often think my failure at school, well, of course, I blame myself. I, at year 12 at high school, I didn't pass. My friends went on to university and professional careers, and I felt very rejected. I, and so I, I repeated year 12, and I failed it again, just to, to prove to myself. <laughs> And it's not easy. And I think, and this doesn't make sense. I feel intelligent, but they don't want me. So uh, that didn't make sense. And I, I was a bit sad about that. But I've reflected and thought uh, that maybe all those years I was resisting this learning, uh, not to be an ignoramus, but I wanted to learn in my own way. In your own way. And I was often looking out the window and making little things out of bits of wire under the desk and wasn't paying attention to that <laughs> rigid learning. And as much as I respect and adore the learned thing, and you know, I like that people really are disciplined and learned, particularly the brain surgeons and the airline pilots, etc. <laughs> um, I was not destined for that. And so I was protecting something, I think, mm. possibly intuitively keeping something alive, that, that, that creative well spirit or yeah. to the inventive, I want to do it my way. Sorry, it's inconvenient for me, but I must do this. I think that holds true. I think that's probably, I think the organism knows what it needs yeah. sometimes <laughs> if you let it find it. And I think I was, I knew what I needed. And so far, it's good enough. Mm. <laughs> Terrible career he's had, failing school. So tell us then, after your, your career actually did begin in newspapers, didn't it? Cartooning and, yeah. and politics and strict deadlines. How did that happen? It doesn't sound like you, does it? That no, but there was regime. a gleeful um, acceptance of it. It was actually the, policy, uh, the politicised time of the Vietnam War and I was very resistant to that. I was, I was conscripted and resisted and all that sort of thing and um, I, that, that mobilised a lot of my feelings and gave me something to get head up about and with politics and that how do these people want to do this? You know, this war is appalling and, and futile and wrong and it's, as it turned out to be. 
and so many, so many of my friends went to Vietnam, etc. And it was very disturbing. And so I started making cartoons for un, what we called underground magazines, little political rags and uh, pa uh, pamphlets and the like. So that's how I started. I wasn't taught how to draw or anything like that. And the 60s was a time of we've, everyone could have a go and make things. And people, there was a music revolution and the Renaissance was so much creativity and it was a time of great originality I think. I think we live now in a time of great uh, professionalism and excellence uh, but not necessarily the, the daring uh, experimentation. Yeah. I think that's been a bit overwhelmed by the, the, by the expertise and the technology mm -hmm. and beautiful production values but sometimes a bit empty at the other end. So it was a time when it was possible for anyone to step into newspapers. Uh, into cartooning, you know, it's a self-taught craft which suited me. So on the strength of that, I was hired and I didn't think, uh, I remember an editor taking me out for lunch and saying, uh, a, news, a new newspaper was starting in Melbourne and he said, look, you'll have to do six cartoons a week, they're going to be done by 9.30 in the morning. And I was pretty ignorant. And he said, can you do it? And I said, yep. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so I just turned up and it was, you know, my heart in my mouth and how can you do it? It's different. No, no, there's no rules. You don't know how to do it except the ones you admire. The, the Bruce Petty was a great inspiration. Bruce Petty was a wonderful inspiration. An artist like Martin Sharp from Sydney, who had this beautiful black and white line and beautiful quality. So just enough people to admire, to guide me. To mm. guide you into it. Sort of, yeah. And so how long did that last? And how, how did we go from the political cartooning to the whimsy, the whimsical world of yeah. the ducks and the teapot? Good question. Um, well, I was hired to comment on political matters, of which I really was so wet behind the ears. I didn't know the depth and the... Uh, of course I didn't. I was 24 by the time I was working. So uh, an editor said, listen, you, have, you don't know what you're talking about. You better go to Canberra. He sent me to Canberra for a while. I saw the politicians in the non-members bar talking to the press, etc., and moved amongst them. I was there that Goff, I was there the day that Goff got the sack, actually, and saw all these very close-up things. Were you on the and, steps? Pardon? Just, just to do... All that, yeah, and okay. what happened after, which was another astonishing story <laughs> we haven't got time for. But uh, So I saw a lot of it intimately but never felt really that this was ultimately what I was interested in. There was a great sort of culture of cleverness, of being on the inside, having all the inside information. and It was a sort of a world apart and these very knowledgeable people, the press and the politicians sort of locked together a little. So, mm. And there's the public out there. And I didn't like that. Clique. And, yeah, it was a clique in a sense and still is, of course. And uh, I felt there was something missing in the whole talk, the discourse, if you like. And that was some other dimension. And I remember, this is how the duck appears in the, you know, I'd be drawing these politicians, not very lovingly and not without <laughs> any real confidence. And I always felt, and I was surrounded by these highly educated people, all the journalists that I seemed to work with had university degrees and were so on the inside and so clever and so witty. And I was not. But I had a lot of feeling about it, you know, and, they, and so they tolerated me. And one day I remember drawing some politicians and sort of like, you know, I think there's something wrong here. I'll put a duck in here, you know. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you're meant to be witty and have this terrific, stunning punchline which just sums it all up and you catch it in one stroke of a pen. All these fantasies people have about cartoons. Cartoons are very, they're also dreadful too. They're dread, sometimes they're true, sometimes they're appalling. They're just propaganda. I mean, Hitler used cartoonists enormously. Um, so, so I thought, I've got to bring nature into this because that's missing in the whole ecosystem of debate and of politics. There's some quality which is very natural and playful and creative. And all the things that the intellectuals I was surrounded with were sort of distancing themselves from They Don't go there, don't, don't go there, that's just infantile. And I said, no, but why is it infantile? Uh, we got a bit, the ecosystem is bigger than just, you know, the economy, the parliament, the legislation. There's other qualities, the things that people carry inside them. They, they talk about around the, or struggle to talk about around the, on their kitchen table and the things we worry about. And then I also came to the belief that well, I'm expected to be this wise guy, critic, you know, making jokes about those people there who've got us in trouble, these 
foolish politicians. That was the tone of it all. Mm. These corrupt people. I became very fascinated in what was our part in this. What, in other words, human nature and the people who were, you know, pointing at the politicians. And I think you must always point to the politicians, of course. But I, I wanted to turn it around on us and what is our part in the way the system is not working or why it's cruel and indifferent and, and the loss of compassion or care? It, what have we got to do with that? And then this leads you to a kind of psychoanalytic understanding mm. somewhat of this, what's driving the unconscious stuff, the ego and all this complexity and then it leads you to why are people like this? What is early childhood development? Why is our society so aggressive and at present so divided and what's this acrimony in the debate? What's this left and right hostility, this sect sectarianism? It used to be Catholic and Protestant when I was a kid, now it's left and right. And I think so much of it is just bitter and cruel and futile and destructive and it saddens me. So I think, why all that? Why? Did and you that have to fight for that though? Did you have to fight the, the, the editors to get that gentle... <laughs> I mean, well, that's where the holy fool comes in, uh, I think. I, I think without trying to be. I'd, sorry? The, the delectable holy fool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it's a nice word. <laughs> delectable. But because it's a sensuous word, you see something delectable, and it's trying to bring that sensuality into life and commentary and bring the senses in. And no, the sky won't fall in if you bring the senses in or the feelings in. And there's so many columnists who say you are a wet lefty, a bleeding heart, this, that, all these defences against, mm. all these intellectual defence against this part of the environment, the human environment. It's, without it, they're, they're trying to kill off a part of us which really belongs in the discussion. And meanwhile, the world is grievously suffering from the conditions which have been described as depression or anxiety, all the disorders, whatever the way they label them, the human heart is not happy. And unless politicians can care directly about that and take some concern, then the system's a poor one, it's inadequate and deficient. So the, the, the poets, the artists, the writers have always been trying to recover this part mm. and drag it back into the... The into duck is an antidote the <laughs> to duck, the eels. <laughs> yeah, and it's an insignificant thing, a duck, oh. it would appear to be, but no. as it turns out, these are archetypal little sort of elements that we have turned away from far too much to our peril, nature, right. playfulness, creativity, innocence, and... But the, the world is a bit dismissive, you know, the big, the tough guys, all the important people up there, they don't talk about ducks. <laughs> <laughs> but they used to, you know. They used to, well, they bring you back. You, um, you quite resonate with that, uh, or you told me that wonderful Henry Miller quote and title of his book, Painters You Like and, and Die Happy. Yes. Do you need to draw and paint and create? Is it a, like a a driving force like breathing? It makes me very happy to, to paint or to create or play. It's a playfulness, isn't it, I find. And one has to, um, to, to move from the daily world into that playful, creative world is not an easy transition, I find. Um, I think we have to live in, with such velocity and cacophony and so much complexity and technology crowding in on us and we, we, we have to defend ourselves against it in a way and it's, it's rushing into us subconsciously. So much film, why do we need so much film and entertainment and flickering lights <laughs> glaring in our faces, you know, and all these uh, surreal kind of other people's experience. And, and the disappearance of trees from our life and nature and all that, it bothers me and I think it makes us unwell. So, so uh, I think creativity is one way of recovering nature and being in nature. But as I say, coming from this hard world into the creative space, into that refuge or serenity 
is, is not easy. And what I discovered, and there's an essay in my book about this, this uh, for, for, for the cartoonist or the painter, you set out with an idea in your head. You say, oh, I've got an idea for a painting. Or, and and you, you start to transcribe it, so to speak, from your brain there. But something is always lost if it starts in the intellect and the mind, the conscious mind. And, you, and then I, I will try and get it going and it looks pathetic and I think, oh, not working, oh, oh dear, um, I'll have to fix it. And then you try to fix it and then it gets worse, you see. Uh, and so, you know, we all know this. And, and it's, a good, uh, it's a good metaphor for human relationship. And, and, you, and then the more you try and fix it, it's just getting messier and messier and worse and worse. And uh, you feel like you're not an artist at all. Other people are wonderful artists, but you're not. You can only create a mess. That's not going to be a good painting. It's, not, it's worthless. It's a mess. So I discovered the joy of regression. Instead of going upwards into excellence and fine art that looks like art, um, as Lao Tzu said, real art does not look like art. And I, that is a comforting thing and I think very true. But to find that authenticity and originality, I found I had to get into this mess. And you couldn't bring it on because who wants to get in a mess? It just happens by itself because you transcribe from the intellect, so to speak. These are very generalised terms. You transcribe and it hasn't got the life and the mystique and the mystery and the, the spirit and vitality in it. And so, as I say, I get in the mess, it gets worse and worse, I'm regressing, I feel miserable about it. So anybody looking at me working wouldn't know that, I look composed, of course. <laughs> but deep down, I'm in that sort of a panic a bit and I'm feeling dreadful. And eventually, you look at this mess and you say, no, I'm not going to leave this, I want to stay with this mess. And you start, and the worst has happened, nothing's at stake anymore, it's all lost. So you start playing because it's lost. And you, and then, suddenly things start to happen in that playful state. Some truths come in. You start to find little bits, little new starts, a little seed. And, and what's happened, I realise, is that the ego has been destroyed. I, dest I, I think appallingly of myself. I'm not an artist, I'm hopeless. So you're humbled. And there in the humbled state yeah. becomes the child state, becomes the holy fool, if you like. And that's when creation starts. So the idea in the head is just the first little doorway in. Then after that, the room of trouble and despair. <laughs> and so anything I've ever done that I've liked has probably taken... Come through that process. Come through that rather painful thing. So when people start talking about how the beauty of creativity... It's tortured. It, it's, it, well, it's, it's, it's not like you don't go and hit the bottle or anything. You stay with it, you know. Yeah. You sort of just stay there and come through it. And there's redemption. So and I think... Isn't it like life? Isn't it like trying to make a home or trying to make a family? The nights of waking up at 3 a.m. and saying, this is terrible, this is all out of control. Or, and, you know, it's <gasps> probably not. Doom, it's cartoon. The whale of doom. <laughs> it's just a little internal thing. Really, your life's probably okay. But yeah, it's <laughs> just a despair we feel, and we don't talk about much, and we don't want to burden each other with these things. But, you know, those primal feelings, and I think. It's good to get to the primal. It opens us up. Yeah. We don't run amok with an axe. <laughs> the sky Think doesn't fall it. in. We just lie there <laughs> meditating. <laughs> it's sweet and it's innocent. And out of that... It all comes. That's what I think... That's one way of creating. I think it's the greatest way. I think that's when we create something we didn't know we were capable of. We find something. We don't create it. We find it and then we work on it with love. Tell us a little bit about the physical surrounding. You know, where do you? What, what's your studio like? Are you a morning creator? Are you an, a late night owl? What? What? How do you work? I wish I could answer that with a, a nice, well-rounded description, Paula. But uh, it's uh, all over the shop. And, um, <laughs> the the, gra the greatest yes. thing is I can work on a tram, you know, on a bus with a bit of paper like that, in a sense, or I can. Um, I can work pretty much anywhere. But of course, it's lovely. Where I live in the bush, I'm a bit of town and country at the moment, but where I am in the bush, it's great to have a big rural shed with a door you can open and, you know, there's materials and there's a kangaroos so around there. They bring nature in. With yeah, you. or the snake there. Because <laughs> it's very enlivening, the bush. So it brings you to your creativity. All these powerful 
strong elements and, and, and so I like that. I like to spend time with my canvas or whatever, paint colours or paint with mud. I love to make a big, you know, bucket full of mud Do you? with, with um, you know, paint. Um, with glue in it. You put, um, you know, what's the common water-based glue? Everyone, yeah. um, anyway. Uh, what's that stuff? A aquid here or something like that? Yeah, you mix it in oh, with the, the mud. Yeah, the white one that you can peel yeah, off your skin. Yeah, oh, you can paint with that. So just creating, or to work at a, a little office or a desk or anywhere where there's a spot. To a little piece and space are the greatest things you can have. And um, and have you ever had a, a long period where your creativity's disappeared? I mean, have you had sort of times where you wondered whether it was going to come back, or is it always? I think away. it is a bit lost and found, definitely, yeah. just a bit, yeah. But you know it's your, your friend, you know it will come back. And I've learned to know that periods of when you think it's lost and when you're despairing about your spirit, you know that's just preempting a great rebirth somewhere of a part of you, that, that disillusionment always precedes creativity in my, my view. I think that's a universal truth, mm. but stay with that that sort of dis disillusionment, it's transitional and we, and then, you know, the light comes on and there's a fertile time. So creativity is a bit cyclical, I think, but the cycles aren't that big. It's, they might be, you know, just over a week, within a week or two weeks, you might have this Down thing. Around. And it's just learning to be patient, stay with, don't get too don't earnest. Panic. Don't panic. I think that's really important about life in general. I, th I think that's a really key word. I think <laughs> there's great panic. panic going on everywhere at the moment. <laughs> and, but it's, you know, everyone's pretending it's all right. But, um, but I think that's it. Don't panic and stay calm. The old virtues our ancestors taught us, you know, be a bit stoical. Don't take yourself, be serious, but don't take yourself too Seriously. heavily and earnestly. Take yourself a bit lightly, you know. All that, those qualities that take a lifetime to learn, I'm still trying. <laughs> well, not taking you too seriously actually reminds me of, of, of a point I'm quite interested in, your relationship with the art establishment in the mm. world of art academia and the institutionalisation of art because it's a theme you explore in Holy Fool and it's a bit love-hate, it's a really interesting mm. part of that essay that you've written in that book. Yes, thank you. I, I, I do have feelings about what I see of the art world, this thing with all its awards and all its, the chosen ones and the, uh, the, uh, the art scholars, all lovely, all important, but they seem to exclude something so often. There's some, the very source of, the divine source of art, uh, the div more divine, the primal, that which is the real wellspring, uh, it's as if that's threatening in some way. And uh, so I, I feel in recent times the art bureaucracy has got bigger and bigger. I mean, we didn't ever have art festivals when we were young. We never heard of such things or a writer's festival. And so I grew up without any of that. There was nothing looming over me in terms of, oh, art is so holy and great. It was just a more an easy finding of it. And um, I, I think... The art world, if I can put it like that, has become rather appalling in many ways and snooty and exclusive and impenetrable. And a lot of contemporary art theory has become just absurd and alienating and cold and over-intellectualised. So I think, think it's, it has it's a lost its organic. If you can have organic food, you can have organic art. And I think, I think it's sort of we've lost our faith in this kind of... The blood and guts of art is something all about the mind and the theory and the, what you're trying to do and all your story, the text about what you're trying to do. Uh, look, it's all right for some, but I, I think it's Do you find it deadening in a way? I find it deadening yeah. to the genuine spirit, the spirited side of art, that soulful part of art. These, these difficult words like soulful or spiritual that people get a bit nervous about, I think be easy about it. It's okay. It's just it's truth. It's it's ancient language, and it refers to something real. And and it's just because it's invisible, and the mystique of art. I, yeah, I, I find I find it off-putting. I think it's too narrow. Also, that these this is the, this is what and it's 
it's it's affected by fashion. The, the, the art world has mm. become afflicted by the most constricted, anal sort of fashion concerns, and um, it, it's linked to media as well. You know, popular concerns. And in Sydney at the moment, we'll see lots of so-called art, and it maybe it is art. Who cares? I don't know. But a lot of it is like a kid's. That's sort of Luna Park or something. It's like Luna Park has been extended, and there's just play things and novelties. That, I'm all for play things and novelties, but it gets a bit precious, and this is art, and who knows what art is. But I would like, I've worked and moved in Indigenous communities, in art centres in Indigenous communities. I love the way the old people, so many of the old people, picked up brushes and colours and painted and made the most astonishing fertile outpouring this country has ever well, the world has seen for a long time, in fact, this be the beauty that came out of the most <coughs> improbable circumstances by people who were not trained, who know nothing of art theory. They just had some, some beautiful vitality and spirit and a willingness and a courage and a sort of playfulness, actually. Oh. I've watched these people, the old women paint, and the way they're willing to have a go, and there it is, it comes off the brush from their hands. Not some concept, but just off their hands and also out of their cultural memory of body paintings, etc. And it's, it's very inspiring. And you see, so what I'm getting at, I says, oh, I wish we Western white originated people could in old age pick up a brush and go to an art centre. Without that. And, and not feel constricted and, oh, I'm, I can't draw properly, I can't draw. It doesn't matter. As long as you enjoy and love and have a, and learn to engage, it's so beautiful, the activity to paint. And we've produced some beautiful painters in this country even. Uh, Sam Byrne, a Broken Hill Miner, produced just a beautiful body, untrained painter with using little enamel paints, his memories of his, his life, etc. Yeah, so, so that's an art world, if you like, that I, I adore and I think is so healthy and so genuine and authentic and, and, and beautiful and alluring and poetic and mm, I love it. You um, actually practised what you preached in this regard, didn't you? Because your deep sort of desire not to stifle creativity with formal learning environments or two formal learning environments led you to and your partner, your wife, to um, homeschool your children. Didn't you? So yes, I don't know. They're why. adults now. Tell us a little bit about how that creative family life decision has turned out. Well, we were in the bush and really in the bush. We were out, out there. We had a lot of space and I don't know how we came to it exactly. We sort of stumbled towards it and suddenly found ourselves doing it. It wasn't much um, also we set out to do this. We had to do it and a lot of that fell to my wife because I was working and you know, I was down there doing my cartoon. And, and eventually we, uh, the paddocks started to teach them too and the animals and the birds and the trees and my son could not read till he was about 10 or 11 but he could read the grass and tell you every little thing and, and uh, he, his eye and his sensibility were to these nature things and it was a form of reading and of course now he's he's at university he loves his learning and mm. he's no problem and daughter as well bright as a button you know and and with a, with a lot of spirit in them I think so it was not easy and your no, heart is in your mouth easy. and you think oh have I done the right thing? have we done well, yeah. as parents do you think, oh I hope this is going to be all right but I I, I, I think when Sounds we're like older we, and when we're old we'll all look back and say wasn't that fantastic to be able to do it wasn't it just so brilliant and such a sort of an Australian thing yeah. in a way out there in the bush you know kangaroos all that, yeah. They That's they knew a lot about the snakes, and the, my daughter has such had such a relationship with snakes. She would leap leap over them and things, laughing, like, yeah. oh, you go, oh, no, don't. We've got to teach you that this, as the indigenous people say, each day faces you like a murderer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the fire, the bushfire, living in the bushfire culture. It's so enlivening too, and you think, "Oh, we're mad, we're crazy, we should be cosy in the city." But you know, you get bonded to this beautiful experience, and it's so enlivening too. Where's your art as well? <laughs> was it you, was you who told me the, the fantastic Picasso quote about how he said it took his whole life 
to learn how to paint like a child again. It's kind yes. Of well, he's alleged to have said that Picasso, and Picasso's like... It reminds like, me of what you just told me about. Yeah, Picasso's like work is beautiful, and I believe it's probably true. It's, you, you've got to sort of move towards this beautiful freedom and what you're able and to be get rid of a lot of this material, become otherworldly, I think. Mm. I think the problem, that's one of my problems with the art world, it's so worldly, it's sort of this place now, here and now. I think art can also off offer this other sense of another dimension which is otherworldly and really deeply, profoundly otherworldly in a nourishing, kind of enlightening way, otherworldly. So that's that, to recover that otherworldly divinity is the work of life also, I would think. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to finish and turn over to your wonderful audience who might like to ask some questions. Where should we start? There's a microphone roving. If anybody has a question they that they feel deeply embarrassed about, please ask <laughs> it because... <laughs> Ah, that is, I want the holy fool question, question that's please. Right. Uh, that's often a very good question. Over here to our left. Would you call yourself a re religious person? Uh, I can't see. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. say that again. Would you call yourself a re religious person? A religious person? Yeah. Well, I don't call myself that, but I guess I am, and it depends on what that word might mean, but I really think, you know, there's this, I use the word spirit and soul, I use the word God in the way that maybe Johann Sebastian Bach, what did he mean when he used that word? I don't care about the fundamentalists who menace us with this concept of God, I can't relate to that, but I used, to, and I've rejected all that, but now I think, what was that word my grandmother used? Um, and uh, and then I come to think, oh, I can handle that if I interpret it poetically. And then I thought, oh, it's in fact, it's a one-word poem, isn't it? Or, you know, things like this, ways into it. So if that's religious, I'm it. But I'm also of this world. There's something of St. Francis in Holy Fool, isn't there? Oh, indeed. Yeah. I guess there is, because I think St. Francis is uh, seen in the church as a, a, an original sort of holy fool. It was a religious was original, concept that he? the holy fool, the, the, the voice of the child, or, or else there's that child who says, hang on, the emperor's got no clothes on, you know, and that's the holy fool, mm. the, the acting on that beautiful innocent impulse to tell a truth that children do so readily. And, I, and I'm trying to say we were all little holy fools in miniature. We all were, and we all did little funny, lovely spontaneous, truthful things of the senses, and then we distanced ourselves from it. And I think it's still there waiting to help you when you want to create, if you dare, or will you want to come through some relationship problems, to open up to the seemingly foolish words or foolish act that is really divinely inspired if it's made with some sort of love, mm -hmm. I think. And we have it all still. But I'm not preaching it, really. I, I just, it's like a, I just something I believe in people. And occasionally you see people, you see them in their grief or in their sorrows and it, they open and it's a beautiful divine quality and the grace that comes through them. I just really like to um, thank you for expressing um, the spiritual through your work and for being there for all of us when we've been in that dark spot looking for a light and thank you for having that courage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very true. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the balance between how much you want your work to have an impact on society and how much it has to actually come from you. And if you don't say it, you feel like you haven't spoken from within you. Uh, I missed that second bit. You said, uh, how much do I want it to have an impact on society? Yes. And, and how much it has to actually come from you, like a burning desire to be expressed. Uh, I think it's mostly, I'm thinking as a natural, spontaneous thing to express, which I would have thought was natural to the human. Didn't we all want to be heard or seen or to enter into the discussion? I think when I was a very a small child, I was affected by so much I heard. 
And if I listened to the radio, I would hear an Oscar Wilde story or I'd hear my grandmother singing an old song or something like this. And you think, well, this is what we do in life. I want to be part of that cycle of being, you know, and I'd be affected. I'd be brought to tears to hear the Oscar Wilde story just as a little child. And I thought, what an extraordinary thing that some words and a story can make you feel and be moved. And I thought, oh, I want to be part of that. It's, an, it's, a, it's a thing I'd like to do. So I don't know whether that answers your question, but... Uh, I don't want to affect anyone in a sense of I don't want to put anything into anybody. They say, what are you trying to convey? I say, what I'm trying to do is maybe awaken what might be in you. It's a catalyst. But I say, I don't understand that thing you've done. What does it mean? I say, I don't know what it means. And I really genuinely don't. I make it, I might not understand it, but as long as I like it and I feel like there's some mysterious kind of quality that might awaken something in other. I'm happy to not to be understood. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to say something to you. I'm trying to ask, hope you, uh, something arises out of it. Yeah. Okay. Is there a question at the front here? I saw um, two things. I have tried to keep Just wait for the microphone. Otherwise, the people won't behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's better. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I carry all the time on Facebook. So. I'm a bit addicted to that, so I'm aware of it. I'm just sending all the time your um, stuff to other people. But uh, I will ask you a question. I, I really read all the books, and I really thank you. Just today, what you talked, it's like, ah, this, <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of people. How do you feel, uh, one question, how do you feel getting colder, knowing that we're all getting I, I'm just curious. How, the question is, how do I feel? About yeah, getting you older. getting older and old, older, old, old age. Oh, older. about getting older. Yeah. That's a terrific question. And I think, why are there's no sessions in a writers' festival from sort of really senior, older writers to have a panel discussion of what is it like? How do you feel about <laughs> this? And, and all these young, beautiful authors coming up and with all their vigor and vim and beautiful works and you think but to be an older artist is a yeah we who is we all have to deal with this don't we god how does it feel for me <laughs> uh, every day <laughs> it's sort of there are days when i think oh how long have i got um does it how does it, how do i go how will i disappear um yeah, those little questions, but sort of okay. I feel there's a freedom so far, and I realise there'll come a time when the pains might start, etc. And, uh, yeah, it's all those normal speculations and wonderments, and, but to be conscious of it and not try and pre pretend you're not and try and be the young man or something or, you know... You know the people who turn 80 and they jump out of a plane with a parachute <laughs> to, to, pr to celebrate their 80th birthday? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I, I think um, there's that we do have a culture where people are in denial and putting off and I don't want to be part of that because I think it's a rich time. I really think it's possible. It's a great liberating time and to embrace it and get into it and recover the holy fool more overtly. You know, one is entitled... I think, to speak freely and hopefully with some degree of wisdom, uh, it's possible. And <laughs> I, I hope I can do a bit of that and keep going. I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah thank and you. No parachutes. <laughs> Over to the front. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, I've been a reader of your work for a long time and I, you know, I used to read my dad's collections of your, of your work, which I loved. But I was just wondering if we could hear a bit more about your influence as a, as a cartoonist. I, you talked about Bruce Petty and, and Martin Sharp, but I always thought your work was kind of related to the work of Jules Pfeiffer in a way as well. You know, yeah. maybe you could talk a bit more about it. Yeah, so I, I can't uh, quite... This is probably my hearing. Uh, I, I was born, he, he de born deaf in one ear, so things can be muffled. He wanted to know more about your influences. Um, mm. So you mentioned Petty and you mentioned... Well, yeah, people like Jules, Jules Pfeiffer. Pfeiffer. Then I discovered this Ferber and, and Tommy Ungerer. The, there was a European cartoonist and, and he's a French cartoonist, beautiful, often in the New York of these days. There was various of the Europeans and... Uh, the English, the private eye cartoonists, the whole lot. 
you see where my influence is. But there's something I'd like to say here about influences. Sometimes we get asked, all of us, who are our influences? And we meant to say, oh, you know, the great ones, the great ones, the great ones. And, of course, they influenced us. But it dawns on me how some of my school friends were great influences on... The, the, your humour grows amongst your friends when you're young, and it was beautiful, and I'm thinking of particular friends now, you know, and great influence, and I appreciate it. And, um, and as I say that, I'm thinking, humour, you know, I'm saying that word, it really has been what I've been about a lot. I often get connected to a lot of the more spiritual things or something, but I think it's all the one. But the humour that you develop when you're young amongst your friends can be so beautiful and <laughs> lively and it sort of fertilises you for the rest of your life in some way. So those are my... I had those many such personal friend influences when I was young. Mm. OK, young lady here. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your talk. It was wonderful. I'd like to take you back to your days of political uh, cartoons uh, and ask you if you were to do one. Um, and this, the reason I ask is because I work for a charity and we're quite distraught at the, um, the impact of uh, the federal budget on vulnerable young Australians. I wonder what you would, ha what you would uh, uh, oh. say or draw <laughs> about uh, Tony Abbott's budget. <laughs> if you were, she's, she wants to take you back to politics. Yes. And if you were to draw a cartoon about this current budget and its impact on young people, what would you draw? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would have to go into that process I described. I'd say, <laughs> I'll get this idea here in my head and I'll get it down and then it'll be all wrong and I'll have to try and fix it and it'll get worse and it'll get worse and then I'll anguish. So I can't tell you. And that's the thing about it. One has to find it and create it and... And, and open up to it and descend into it. And then it comes an insight. That because... <laughs> what do I think? Oh, the budget. I, look, I, I really don't think I could... Uh, it's, I think it's a dark time in some ways. And it seems to be a flashpoint. It seems... It's, it just, this hasn't just suddenly come along. I think Australia has become gradually, gradually, gradually more disillusioned and hurt and alienated from the political process for a long, long time. And this is just, you know, one step, a very serious step. And all that's implied in the budget, I mean, who of us really understands the economic, <laughs> the economic system that we can be, to really understand this? But we sense something else in the demeanour of the whole thing, in the way it is sort of... I'll say a terrible thing, I, rec I'm not a t I don't want to get into the bitterness of politics, but there was a story going around when Tony Abbott was running for parliament and w w was running for uh, the leadership of the country and uh, some woman came forward who knew him in student politics and she claimed that after a debate he had come up to her and punched the wall behind her head and punched it again behind her head in this intimidating way. It appears she had no reason to be lying. She stuck with her story. I feel there's something of that going on in the whole country. Mm. There's some punching the wall behind us, yeah, some fine. intimidation. And it's that, apart from all the economics, which I have views about, and I think it's, I think it's flaw or wrong, it's not going to work. And, uh, but I think I, don't, I dislike this intimidation and this culture war thing in the ideology and I think a lot of Australians are feeling similar and I'm very attuned to what I'm hearing and I, it, I think they just resent being bullied. We're allowed one more. Um, thank you. Down the front. I just wanted to, uh, to ask because I'm listening to you and you seem so soft but when you when we read your cartoons, it seems to punch. You know. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's something I don't know. Yes, well. That's the power. Uh, uh, yeah, well. Where's the power? Where so be it. But I, I just want to say something. Sometimes people react so sort of, I've been drawn into some appalling public controversies mm -hmm. and it seems that I've offended practically every group <laughs> in, my, <laughs> uh, in my career 
Andy, would you believe this? I don't think I've really set out to offend any of them. It's sort of an accident. I thought I was just putting something on the table. I thought that's the society we were. We can propose, we can put forward an idea and have it considered. That is naive, but I stick by that and I will continue to do that. But, um, but people, it's interesting how people react as if you have just made a law under which they must live or you have drafted an act of parliament. And it's as if there's also a loss of, you know, this so-called politics of indignation, um, the indignation and people are brutal and... Uh, so I don't, I don't feel I'm punching people. I, I don't want to do that. I really you don't. <laughs> I'm tickling them a little. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, look, but I do recognise that in time, in time uh, there are moments when... I realise I've hurt people, but but not intentionally. And I realise there are times when I've been hurt. And later I think, yeah, but it wasn't so bad. I processed it and, uh, or people, you know, these are feelings. I'm a feeling person. We, we all hurt each other, but it, it's our intention and our motivation. To tell a truth sometimes can be very hurtful. You know, when the doctor, when the dentist goes in there to fix us, he hurts sometimes, or she hurts. <laughs> but, you know, it's a bit like that. But I do regret any hurt where I have distressed anyone. I do. And there are times, particularly when I was younger, when I s s sort of, you know, on a deadline was a little unwise or too rash or something like this. Yeah, I have regret of that. But that's what happened. It's not, it's not so bad. I'm willing to talk about it with anyone who was hurt. I think... <laughs> it's I think called restorative <laughs> justice. Exactly. <laughs> I think we are, we've all enjoyed it. It's been a great honour for me. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you.